This video is essentially a continuation of the previous video where we have seen the clinical features of tuberculosis. So in this also we are going to continue with the clinical features of tuberculosis and what are the organs that are involved in tuberculosis. So this video will give special preference to the CNS and the spinal tuberculosis that's all also referred to as something called a pot spine. So without wasting much time let us move on to the CNS tuberculosis. You have two classical manifestations in a central nervous system tuberculosis. One is the tubercloma and second one is the tuberculous meningitis. But many of the times both may coexist together. It's not like you will get only a tubercloma or it's not like only you are going to get a tuberculous meningitis. You can get both tubercloma and a tuberculous meningitis at the same time also. So first let us see what do you mean by a tubercloma and what are the clinical effects of a tubercloma. So typically tubercloma is going to present like a mass lesion. That's how they are going to present. So these are granulomas that are present in the brain. So they are going to present like a mass lesion only. The clinical features of tubercloma may be completely variable. First of all, they can be completely asymptomatic, which is actually quite common. Or they can be presenting with headache. Or they can even present with seizures. This presentation with seizures is especially common in young adults especially. As I told you before, some patients may have an associated tuberculous meningitis also. So you cannot predict in what way they are going to present. And all these presentations are quite non-specific. You cannot really detect by clinical methods. So you need to do an imaging. The characteristic imaging technique that we are going to do is an MRI obviously. That's what we are going to do. So when you do an imaging technique, what you are going to see is a ring enhancing lesion. So this ring enhancing lesion is very characteristic of not only tubercloma, you have a lot of DDs for this ring enhancing lesion. Especially when you do a CT contrast or a contrast MRI, you are going to see this ring enhancing lesion, what are the DDs for that. First one, obviously we have discussed already it's a tubercloma and the second one you have neurocysticercosis and the third one you have brain abscess and the fourth DD is cerebral toxoplasmosis and the fifth one finally you have primary CNS lymphoma especially in HIV patients. You have coccidioidomycosis also but very rare. In India it is not so common to get that disease. So primary sinus lymphoma in HIV patients. Why it only special in HIV patients? Because in those patients only it will be ring enhancing. Whereas a primary sinus lymphoma in an immunocompetent individual may be homogeneously enhancing, not ring enhancing. So that is why in HIV patients only it tends to enhance in a ring enhancing pattern. Okay. In this, the brain abscess is a little bit easy to find out, especially in the clinical context. If the patient has an infected endocarditis, or if the patient is having a sinusitis or an auditory dysmedia, some clinical context or an odontogenous spread will be there from dental infection. So some clinical context you will be getting. At the same time, it will be very irregular, large most of the times. So it will be something different. You can find it out. We will discuss later on in the CNS section. At the same time, your cerebral toxoplasmosis and primary CNS lymphoma, again it is easy to find out with the clinical context because you will be having these disorders in the context of HIV only. So it's relatively easy to find out. But this tubercloma and the neurocysticercosis are the ones which are very difficult to differentiate by your routine clinical context because both can be either asymptomatic and picked up incidentally or both can be presenting with seizures. So you can't predict how they are going to present. So that's why your differentiation is very important. How you are going to differentiate a tubercloma versus a neurocysticercosis. So first thing we are going to do something called a diffusion weighted imaging in MRI where tubercloma will show definitely a restricted diffusion where you won't find any diffusion restriction in case of neurocysticercosis. Instead in neurocysticercosis you will see a cystic lesion and you can visualize the scolex which will be eccentric within the cyst that you can find it out. I will show you the image. Second, you can also do a technique called MR spectroscopy. This technique is widely employed actually for differentiating pediatric brain tumors. So for that only they use MR spectroscopy most often especially for tumors in the brain to differentiate the type of the tumor by MRI itself. 
but it can be used and it's of paramount importance especially for one non-tumorous condition that is called a tubercloma. So what are the findings in MR spectroscopy? Two findings because a lot of findings are there but two findings I'll tell you because you are not oriented towards this MRS uh, especially the undergrads and even the postgrads. I'll tell you some two findings which is very important. The first one is the lipid peak. The lipid peak is so characteristic of a tubercloma. And second one, you have a characteristic choline creatinine ratio of more than one. It's not that characteristic, but still, if you have a combination of these two, definitely you can concretely diagnose in the clinical context that it's a tubercloma. Neurocystic sarcosis will not have any of these findings. In fact, they will have a very low level of all these metabolites in MRS, in MR spectroscopy. So let us see the difference in the first place. So I'll show you initially how you're going to get a tubercloma, clear? So this is a characteristic tubercloma that you are going to get. So you can see this is a right frontal region where you are seeing a small area of diffusion restriction or restricted diffusion and this is an image of a diffusion weighted imaging. And in MR spectroscopy, what you are looking out is the lipid peak. This is the lipid peak and typically you have a choline creatinine ratio of more than one. So you can see creatinine is very less and choline is very high and choline creatinine ratio of more than one with a characteristic lipid peak is very very characteristic of tubercloma. So this patient is definitely a tubercloma. I am going to diagnose only tubercloma. And next you can have neurocystic sarcosis. This is an example of a neurocystic sarcosis where this is a normal MRI and this is a diffusion weighted imaging sequence in the MRI. So where you can see there is no diffusion restriction at all and you are seeing a cystic structure. In the routine MRI, you can visualize that scolex also, some head like structure that is coming here. So that's a scolex and it's a cystic lesion. And next, when you are doing a MR spectroscopy. So this is a MR spectroscopy. You can see not even any metabolite is elevated. It's all very, very less. So this low level of metabolites will be seen uniformly. Not even one metabolite will be elevated. So this is suggestive of a neurocystic sarcosis. So this patient I'm going to diagnose as neurocystic sarcosis. Very, very simple. So this manifestation is again very important that you have to know. Clear? Then with this we can move on to the next segment that is on tuberculous meningitis. So what you are going to see in tuberculous meningitis, so what are the features of tuberculous meningitis? You have three characteristic stages in tuberculous meningitis. One is called a prodromal phase and second one you have meningitic phase and the third one is called paralytic phase. So what you will get in prodromal phase? The patient will have only constitutional symptoms along with that patient may have some personality changes. So this is the prodromal phase. What you will see in the meningitic phase? In the meningitic phase the patient will have headache, patient may have neck rigidity. These are characteristic features of meningitis. I am not telling any Greek and Latin. These patients may have vomiting and these patients may have cranial palsies. The most common and the most important cranial that to be paralyzed in a tuberculous meningitis is cranial number 6. And the patient may have long tract signs. What do you mean by long tract signs? For example, hemiparesis, pyramidal tract involvement, corticospinal tract involvement may be there, which may result in hemiparesis or even a quadriparesis. Then come to the paralytic stage. Here the patient will be confused or they may be even stuporous or comatose, they'll go for severe hemiparesis. Many of the long tracts will be completely damaged in the paralytic stage, so they'll be completely hemiparetic or quadriparetic. So this is what we refer to as a paralytic stage. These are the three classic stages of tuberculous meningitis and there are some staging also for tuberculous meningitis. Again, you have three stages of tuberculous meningitis. One is called a stage one, then stage two, then stage three. So stage 1 means there is no focal neurological deficit at all. At the same time, patient is not having any evidence of hydrocephalus. 
In stage 2, the patient will start getting phoconeurgical deficit, but the patient will have only mild hemiparesis or some few cranial nerve palsies, one or two cranial nerves may be involved, like cranial number 6. In stage 3, the patient will start getting severe focal neurological deficits in the form of dense hemiparesis, that is the patient will be completely bedridden and the patient will be in stupor, coma and, and patient may have recurrent seizures which may even progress towards status epilepticus and the patient will have multiple cranial nerve palsies. So it is somewhat similar to the uh, your uh, faces, you know, like, but they are not the same, but this is a little bit different from stage. So you have to understand that. So there are three phases and three stages of tuberculous meningitis, clear. So are we going to make a diagnosis? Because it's difficult to make because they can present with any kind of presentation, like you can mistake it for encephalitis, you can mistake it for encephalopathy clinically, you can mistake it for a delirium, you can mistake it for a tumor, so it can mimic anything. So how you are going to make a diagnosis? So first is imaging. Imaging wise what we prefer is the MRI. CT we don't prefer generally but still you can do a CT in resource limited settings but what we are going to prefer is ideally the MRI. That's the best imaging technique. What are the findings you are going to see? The first finding and the most common finding in tuberculosis is hydrocephalus, tuberculous meningitis, 75 percentage of the cases. Then you can see this basal exudates. At the same time, you might see basal meningeal enhancement. In exam, if you get this basal exudates and basal meningeal enhancement is equal to TB unless proved otherwise, but it is seen only in 45 to 50 percent of the cases. Third, you can get infox also, 15 to 20 percent of the cases, or you can see associated tuberculomas. We discussed this already. That can be seen in 5 to 10 percentage of the cases. But remember, presence of basal meningeal enhancement and hydrocephalus itself indicates a poor prognosis. Marked basal en enhancement, if you have a significant basal en enhancement with hydrocephalus itself is a poor prognostic sign. Indicates a very advanced meningeal disease. That is the idea because this TB cooks up for a very long time. So that's why it's not going to present immediately. So they may present in a very advanced stage as usual. Fine. What are the CSF studies you are going to do? CSF, even though traditionally a lot of things have been described, but you don't see all the classic things in the CSF. For example, you have very, very high protein, even as high as 1 grams per deciliter has been described, which typically produces the very sticky consistency. That's what we called as cobweb appearance. All these things in the current era, it's very difficult to see. Classic, but not common. I told you whenever you call the word classic in medicine, it is seen in less than 20% of the cases. It's not that common, rare. And you'll have very low sugars, all right, not going to tell you anything. And when you see definitely the count, cell counts will be increased and majority of the cells will be lymphocytes. And again, it's quite non-specific. You can get this increased lymphocytes in many, many other conditions like fungal meningitis also, even other causes of meningitis also you might have elevated lymphocytes. So that is not going to be very specific. So what is going to be specific? And again, AFB is not. AFB finding in a tuberculous meningitis is very, very rare, acid pus bacillus, because the yield is very, very poor. But you can do a gene expert. Gene expert. WHO recommends this gene expert as a first line test for CSF meningitis, even though it doesn't recommend for your pleural effusion or ascites diagnosis of tuberculosis. But here in CSF, it's actually recommended. Remember, what are the fluids if they ask you where gene expert is recommended? Only CSF. Pleural fluid is not recommended. And again for the uh, acetic fluid it is not recommended. But remember WHO recommends this gene expert that is CB0 cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test as the first line test. One of the first line tests. But remember here also it, since it's a fluid the yield is going to be extremely low. So you need multiple sampling. At least you have to take three samples over three days. Three samples over three days you have to take. Clear? So this is a very, very important point again. 
and next you can do ADA also in CSF where the levels may be more than 40 which might be sus suggesting of tuberculosis meningitis. But remember ADA more than 40 and this presence of moderate or mild hydrocephalus with basal meningeal enhancement with basal exudates that word itself is enough to start treating as a tuberculosis meningitis. So there is nothing else. So this most of the time is a tuberculosis meningitis is a clinically diagnosed entity. At the same time your tubercloma also will be a clinically diagnosed entity. It's very difficult to isolate the organism in the CNS tuberculosis patients. So they can also result in spinal tuberculosis. Spine also may be involved. That's called spinal tuberculosis arachnoiditis. This is a very, very old disease. Nowadays, we don't see this because of the advancement in the therapy. Spinal tuberculosis arachnoiditis. Clear? So these are the three manifestations, but the most important are the tuberculomas and tuberculosis meningitis. So let us see the images. You can see here, so this is a contrast CT which is showing the basal systems are enhanced very nicely. So this is called a basal enhancement or basal cisternal enhancement and you can actually equate the same with your MRI picture also. In MRI also you have a lot of basal cisternal enhancement with a little bit of hydrocephalus and this is an image showing tubercloma. We have seen that already but here there is multiple tuberculomas and all are characteristically ring enhancing. You can see isn't it? These are actually ring enhancing lesions. So I told you the DD is for ring enhancing lesions and how to approach for tuberculoma already. And this is an example of a miliary tuberculosis. This is a miliary deposits in the brain. This is a miliary tuberculosis and miliary deposits in the brain. So this is something again you have to understand. So these are the, some of the images I want to show. And next, we can move on to the urogenital TB, urogenital tuberculosis. Remember, you have urologic TB and you have genital, genital very commonly with females only. So what are the features of urologic TB? Remember, the organs that are affected in urological TB is very commonly the kidneys. The renal TB is more and more common than the ureteric or bladder related TB. And most often, obviously, the urological TB will be unilateral, not bilateral. This is the most common presentation. And how they are going to present? Typical features will be dysuria, flank pain. They may have hematuria and obviously they have constitutional symptoms. Along with all this, they might have associated constitutional symptoms. So and again, these are quite non-specific. Very difficult to find out. To be honest, the urogenital TB is not that easy to find out unless until you have a tissue biopsy and you send that is characteristic of tuberculosis. But these are very non-specific findings in clinical picture. So some CT findings in exam wise, if you want to ask, so some characteristic named signs are very important. So that's what they're going to ask in exam. Apart from that, they're not going to ask much in exam. So I'm going to tell that only. So what will be the imaging findings? So first we are going to see the CT. In the CT, if they ask you most common finding, obviously you are going to see the calcifications. That's going to be the most common findings. And typically they may also show multiple strictures. Multiple strictures with calcification or sometimes even a cavity formation. That is also possible. So these are some of the CT findings. What will be the X-ray findings? One of the important x-ray finding they might be asking in an exam is the finding called putti kidney or otherwise referred to as semen kidney which happens it's an end stage kidney disease in case of tuberculosis where this kidney is completely destroyed and it is fully calcified. It's a fully calcified kidney. That's what we refer to as a putti kidney or a semen kidney because the name came from a putti as a cement. Then you have some intravenous pyelography findings also. These are very old findings, but still only for the exam sake I'm telling you all this. So they might characteristically produce the moth-eaten appearance of the calyx. The calyx may show 
moth eaten appearance that is because of the erosions that is because of the erosions the calyx may show a moth eaten appearance slowly 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 they might progress towards renal papillary necrosis because one of the important cause of renal papillary necrosis is tuberculosis apart from diabetes and pyelonephritis so renal papillary necrosis this might obstruct the urine flow and they may even result in hydronephrosis hydronephrosis so this is what you will be seeing in the early stages but in the late stages you might see a very rigid and fibrotic ureter that is what we refer to as a golf ball ureter that's a rigid and fibrotic ureter the name given to that is called as golf ball ureter and obviously you might see a irregularly contracted bladder rigid thickened irregularly contracted bladder we refer to that as something called a thimble bladder thimble bladder clear so these are the findings that you have to know especially this putty kidney the name then golf ball ureter thimble bladder then this moth eaten appearance of the calyx so all these things are some of the words that you have to remember for the exam because the urogenital tb itself is a very rare entity we are facing right now but in exam this words might be given which might trigger you to diagnose a urogenital tb but currently one important investigation is there that has some diagnostic value because it's very difficult disease to find out but he has some investigation that is called a urinary lipoarabinomannan lam that's called a urinary lipoarabinomannan urinary lam and this has been studied extensively in patients who are having urogenital tb and hiv so extensively studied in hiv patients now they are trying to incorporate into the immunocompetent people also but it, this was studied originally for hiv patients only and it has showed an excellent diagnostic value urinary lipoarabinomannan which is a component of the tb bacilli that's all then second one is the genital tb genital tb is very common in women and the most common structure that is affected by the genital tb is the fallopian tubes fallopian tubes but remember they affect bilaterally kidneys i told you and the urogenital tract i told you they affect unilaterally but this fallopian tubes can be affected bilaterally and it is very common in the females only obviously and what could be the clinical features clinical feature they will be producing obstruction and because of that they might be coming with infertility because of obstruction of the fallopian tubes and this can be visualized in the histosalpingography also this histosalpingography also may show this obstruction at the same time histosalpingography may show obstruction in the fallopian tubes at the same time in tuberculosis usually there will be multiple constrictions along the length of the fallopian tubes constrictions and dilatations probably so this are the some of the findings i want to tell for genital tb there was genital tb tends to be bilateral affecting women most common structure affected is the fallopian tubes they come with obstruction of the fallopian tube and probably infertility it's a salping histo salpingogram will be diagnostic technique which is going to show obstructions with multiple constrictions tissue biopsy may be taken through the hsd hsg itself when you are doing a hysteroscopy along with histo salpingography you can take a biopsy from the tissue the next form of tuberculosis will be dermatologic tuberculosis dermatologic tuberculosis the most common dermatological complication of tuberculosis is called as lupus vulgaris lupus vulgaris this is the most common dermatological manifestation of tuberculosis and it's going to most commonly affect the face remember a lupus perineum is also going to affect the face discoid lupus erythematosus also affect the face commonly and this lupus vulgaris also affects the face very commonly and malar rash in sle also affects the face very commonly so a lot of rashes which affect the face very commonly lupus vulgaris also affects the face very very commonly so how they are going to present you know very well they are going to present with reddish brown lesions we are going to call it as apple jelly nodules reddish brown lesions which present apple jelly nodules which later may turn into ulcers 
clear but remember erythema nodosum is not a direct manifestation of tuberculosis it is a hypersensitivity reaction to tubercular antigen so erythema nodosum acts as a hypersensitivity reaction to tubercular antigen only it is not a direct manifestation of tuberculosis which means erythema nodosum we just see a subcutaneous fat inflammation that's called paniculitis so that's a completely different entity you can see erythema nodosum very very commonly in tuberculosis we have discussed already in sarcoidosis itself but on the contrary this is not a direct manifestation in fact instead it's a hypersensitivity reaction to tubercular antigen but this lupus vulgaris you can actually demonstrate the organisms which means it's a direct manifestation of tuberculosis lupus vulgaris we can also see the cardiac manifestations of tuberculosis remember tuberculosis directly involved in the cardiac muscle is quite rare so myocardial involvement with tuberculosis is extremely rare only sporadic two or three case reports i have seen but apart from that i have never encountered in my life myocardial involvement of tuberculosis but pericardial involvement is quite common common we have seen some cases especially in india one manifestation is always equivalent to tuberculosis that is constrictive pericarditis constrictive pericarditis clear okay, this means it's tuberculosis in india it's a very common cause of constrictive pericarditis in india is tuberculosis in western world it's radiation exposure so here it is tuberculosis only how will you diagnose constrictive pericarditis and again this is explained in tremendous detail in cardiology section but right now i will tell you you have to prove the thickened pericardium if you prove that the pericardium is thickened or if you prove that the pericardium is calcified then you can confirm it's a constrictive pericarditis only so best imaging is six chest i mean uh, computer tomography you can do a chest x ray but in chest x ray you can can't see the thickened pericardium but you can see the calcified pericardium most often but what chest x ray will prefer is the lateral chest x ray all these things i have explained in the cardiology section under constrictive pericarditis but the x ray what you have to prefer is a lateral chest x ray to determine i mean to demonstrate the calcifications of the pericardium at the same time this thickened pericardium is best demonstrated by the computer tomography only chest ct only where pericardial thickness of more than 4 mm is confirmatory for constrictive pericarditis normal thickness will be 2 mm or less if it is more than 4 mm definitely it is confirmatory for constrictive pericarditis so let us move on to some images now here in the images section you can see this is an example of a normal ivp this is how it should look like but here you can see a lot of calcial erosions so these are nothing but calcial erosions and these are actually suggestive of renal papillary necrosis and this is a fully calcified kidney a completely calcified kidney looks like a putty isn't it so that's why this is what we refer to as a putty kidney or a cement kidney and here you can see a grossly thickened pericardium this is an example of a constrictive pericarditis i'm going to show a similar kind of the image in in your uh, cardiology section also but just wait on so now just for understanding sake i'm showing all this images so these are some of the images that you have to know regarding the urogenital tuberculosis then we can see the skin manifestations remember this is the typical lupus vulgaris this is a typical lupus vulgaris where you are seeing the apple jelly nodule this is a reddish brown nodule called as apple jelly nodule and if you take a biopsy you can catastly diagnose whatever you want to you can see the organism you can culture the organism and you might even see the cassius necrosis this is lupus vulgaris but this is not lupus vulgaris you know this is just a scrofula just an example i'm showing again here this is again not a lupus vulgaris this is a scrofula derma i told you again whenever you have a underlying lymphadenopathy due to tuberculosis and you have a adjacent skin involvement that will not be called as lupus vulgaris that will be called as scrofuloderma only so to differentiate all these three things only i have showed you these three images we here you don't see lymphadenopathy you don't have lymphadenopathy and you have a direct skin involvement from tuberculosis without any background lymphadenopathy that's what we refer to as typical and classic lupus vulgaris the next this is what you're going to discuss on the, the tuberculosis is on the bone and joint tuberculosis bone and joint tuberculosis in the bone and joint tuberculosis you know joint involvement will produce tuberculous arthritis relatively straight forward diagnosis if you have a good suspicion and if you have microbiological confirmation and this bone tuberculosis 
is of two types. One is called a TB osteomyelitis. And again, straightforward diagnosis if you have a microbiological confirmation. Clear? And second one is the TB spondylitis. A tubercular spondylitis, otherwise called as tubercular disease of the vertebral column. And this is what we refer to as POTS spine. But please do remember, this is the most important thing because of two reasons. One, more than 50% case of the bone and joint tuberculosis will be pot spine only, which means among the bone and joint tuberculosis, pot spine is the most common. And second, majority of the cases can be diagnosed by radiological aspects. That's why the radiology of the pot spine is again very important. But you have to know where the pot spine is very common. So it commonly affects the thoracic spine. Extremely common and the most common manifestation because of thoracic spine involvement will be the kyphosis. This will be followed by lumbar spine. But remember, pyogenic spondylitis will affect the lumbar spine more commonly. But TB spondylitis will affect the thoracic spine only. Very, very common is thoracic spine. Clear? So always TB means thoracic spine. That's all. That is the important thing for exam. And most common clinical manifestation or most common deformity if they ask you, as it is pot spine will be kyphosis because of thoracic spine involvement. That's all. So now we can move on to types of this pot spine. What are the different types of pot spine? You can see this image and you can uh, tell very clearly. So the number one here indicates a paradiscal lesion. Remember, so I can put a different color. So this is a paradiscal lesion. This is where your TB will be in paradiscal. So that's why we have mentioned here also the paradiscal lesion will be on the sides of the intervertebral disc. That's why it's called a paravertebral lesion and it's going to destroy the end plates of the vertebra. So this is classic paradiscal type 1. And there are some characteristic uh, features of this paradiscal involvement. The first one being the most common type. So among all the pot spine varieties, this paradiscal type tends to be the most common the most common overall and in adults also. Next, the spread of tuberculous bacilli to produce this paradiscal type will be arterial spread. Because the type 2, next we are going to see the central type that is going to be spread through the venous route. So this is arterial spread, number second point. Third point, what are going to be the features of this paradiscal type? So they are going to have joint space narrowing or that vertebral disc, that space will be there, no? so that will be narrowed. So that's called a joint space narrowing or you can write as disc space reduction. Remember, many other varieties which I'm going to discuss after this will not have that much significant disc space reduction. This paradiscal variety is the one that's going to have significant disc space reduction in the first place. Then, and they have indistinct paradiscal margin. Obviously, this is a paradiscal erosion. So there, how can you see the paradiscal margin clearly? So this is what we refer to as the paradiscal margin. And how can you see the paradiscal margin if you affect this paradiscal area and you destroy them? So indistinct paradiscal margin. And more importantly, this variety will have a very, very high incidence of paravertebral abscess. Paravertebral abscess formation. There are some other varieties also form paravertebral abscess, but this is the one that produces maximum risk of developing a paravertebral abscess. Clear? So these are some of the features of this paradiscal lesion. Then you have type 2, which is a central lesion. You can see central means it affects the central portion of the vertebra. You can see here. So this is the one, central lesion, type 2. This is the second most common type. At the same time, this is due to venous spread of the bacilli rather than the arterial spread. This is due to the venous spread of the bacilli, point number two. Third one, what will be the features in the imaging, in the radiology? Here, there will be typically the destruction and ballooning of the vertebral bodies. You know that the body will be the affected. So obviously, there will be destruction and ballooning of vertebral bodies. And because of that, because the central portion is destroyed and ballooned out, 
there will be a concentric collapse of the vertebrae upon itself. That's a very important feature again. So there will be a concentric collapse of the vertebrae upon itself. But the disc space reduction will be very normal. Joint space narrowing or the disc space reduction in this particular type 2, central type is very, very rare. You don't get very commonly. And the type 3. What is type 3? Type 3 is referred to as anterior lesion. You can see it's affecting the anterior portion of the vertebra. That's what is mentioned here. We are seeing the type 3 anterior. So what are some of the features of the type 3? That is anterior lesion. Remember, it is not the most common, but relatively common in pediatric population. Relatively common in pediatric population. But the spread here will not be arterial, will not be venous, but be subperiosteal or subligamentous spread. Either a subperiosteal or a subligamentous spread. That's what you're going to see here. So Typically what you are going to see, you are just going to see scalloping of the anterior margin of the vertebra. Very simple. Scalloping of the anterior margin of the vertebra. And this is what we refer to as aneurysmal phenomenon. They look like an aneurysm. So we call that as aneurysmal phenomenon because the scalloping and along with the collection in between, you can see that like an aneurysm. That's what we call aneurysmal phenomenon. So the scalloping of the anterior margin of the vertebra is very characteristic. But remember overall in any tuberculosis, Whenever the number of vertebra involved is more than two, it increases the risk of TB spondylitis. Usually in pyogenic spondylitis, you will not involve that much vertebra. Whenever more than two vertebra are involved, usually it goes towards a TB spondylitis than a pyogenic spondylitis. And last but not the least, the fourth one, we call that as appendiceal lesion. Clear? The other name for this appendiceal lesion is posterior or neural arch type. They can also be called as posterior type or neural arch type where you are seeing in these areas, the posterior regions. So this is what we call it appendiceal and I can see in this image also, this is what we call appendiceal type. What are the features? These patients will have involvement of the posterior arches, involvement of the posterior arches plus or minus they will have adjacent rib erosions. The adjacent ribs will be eroded and the disc space will be preserved and this type may have paravertebral abscess but other types don't except the first type that is paradiscal. This type may have paravertebral abscess but more importantly they have rib erosions. That's what is the defining feature here. Clear? And they will have a preserved disc space. That's also a very defining feature. They won't have any problem in the disc space at all. Absolutely preserved disc space. So these are the different types of your pot spine, different areas of TB spondylitis that you have to know. Then a few point on the paravertebral abscess. Paravertebral abscess. Remember, paravertebral abscess, you can classify as above D10, that is 10th thoracic vertebra or below D10. Above D10 or below D10. Suppose if it's going to be above D10, there can be two types of abscess. One is called a fusiform abscess or a globular or a tense abscess. Fusiform abscess will be something like this. You know very well where the length of the abscess obviously will be more than the width of the abscess. So here the length is more than the width of the abscess. Whereas globular or tense abscess usually will have length that will be less than the width of the abscess. So here the length will be less than the width of the abscess. And this abscess will be very, very tense usually. And this itself will cause pressure effects on the spinal cord and they can produce paraplegia. So usually the risk of paraplegia is more with globular kind of abscess compared to other abscess types you get. And fusiform abscess is also referred to as bird's nest as abscess. I'll show you why it's called bird's nest because it looks like a bird's nest in imaging. So that's why it's also referred to as a bird's nest abscess. It's a very common form, fusiform type of abscess, bird's nest type of abscess. Typically it's common if the lesion is below the fourth thoracic vertebra. If it happens below D4 but above D10, so you might get a fusiform type of abscess. Clear?
So these are some of the important things that you have to know about the parietal arteries. But we didn't discuss about the what will happen if it's below D10. If it's below D10, you will just result in a bilateral widening of a psoas shadow, which means it starts spreading along the psoas major muscle. So that's why you get only one imaging finding. Typically in MRI, you see all these things that bilateral widening of the psoas major and the psoas shadow in the X-ray. Clear? So this is what you're going to see in the different types of paravertebral abscess. Then we'll move on to the clinical features. The clinical features of TB spondylitis tend to be relatively simple. Only some of the most common that were in the previous year questions that are regularly asked in exam. For example, the most common symptom is supposed to be the back pain followed by the back stiffness, followed by the back stiffness. That's going to be the most common. But it's understood why you get the back pain, the back stiffness, because of the spasm of the paravertebral muscles. It's a very well-known entity. It's a very simple fact. This doesn't need much of a comprehension. Then what is the most common and the earliest sign? Most common and the earliest sign in TB spondylitis is going to be tenderness in the involved area. And again, a very simple and straightforward one. And what will be the most common complication of TB spondylitis? Most common complication we already discussed is going to be the kyphosis deformity followed by paraplegia that is due to spinal cord compression. So if they ask you the most common neurological deficit in TB spondylitis, it's paraplegia that is due to spinal cord compression. Simple. Now we are moving into the ever important imaging perspective of a TB spondylitis. What are the things you will be seeing in the imaging? And uh, in the imaging, the most important type of imaging is the MRI. MRI is the most important diagnostic modality. Obviously, it's going to show the diagnosis. It's going to show some characteristic features that is going to prove that it's a TB spondylitis most of the times. CT is a less useful imaging technique. CT is not at all accurate. CT is usually preferred only for guiding the biopsies. Because taking biopsy and aspiration of that site is very important because you have to send it for culture and you have to prove by microbiological confirmation this is the gold standard for diagnosis. And you have to, I mean, whenever it's possible, it's better to take, right? So microbiological confirmation. So that is the reason why CT is useful in the terms of guiding the biopsies and taking the aspirates and all to send for cultures. X-rays, yes, they are useful, especially if you're an experienced reader but still it can neither make a diagnosis concretely nor it will helpful in guiding the treatment or any investigation approach. So it can make a diagnosis to an extent. So you can see the some features like this paradiscal margins are indistinct paradiscal margins. Then you can see the abscess to an extent. You can see the vertebral body collapse. All these things to an extent you can visualize in the x-rays itself. But MRI is going to be our key. So how with an MRI, you're going to diagnose a TB spondylitis. The characteristic changes include there will be destruction of two adjacent vertebras, two adjacent vertebra, especially the vertebral body. And the end plate margin will be indistinct. End plates will show indistinct margins and they may also show relative destruction but intervertebral disc destruction will be only mild to moderate intervertebral disc destruction will be only mild to moderate it will not be as severe as that of a pyogenic spondylitis i'll tell you but still there will be some amount of intervertebral destruction there will be some amount of end, end plate destruction also where you'll be seeing only indistinct end plates and especially this more than two vertebral involvement is very very characteristic of a uh, tuberculous spondylitis and the patients may exhibit this subligamentous or subperiosteal spread and that's also very characteristic especially if it's exceeding for more than two vertebra again the spread and again it's very characteristic of a tuberculous spondylitis plus at the same time patient may have a paravertebral or an epidural abscess patient may have paravertebral or epidural abscess even the abscess can be even a prevertebral abscess also so what about this 
paravertebral abscess. Remember, whenever you see a paravertebral abscess, the abscess will be well defined. If you are having a TB spondylitis, at the same time, they will have a very smooth and irre I mean regular walls. The walls will be smooth, thin and will be regular and will be a well defined abscess. So these are the points to tell that it is a tubercular spondylitis because you have to differentiate this entity from pyogenic spondylitis. That is why I told you all these points. So now let us move on to the pyogenic spondylitis. Pyogenic spondylitis versus a tubercular spondylitis. The first thing is going to be on the location. So what is the location of a pyogenic and tubercular spondylitis? Most common location of pyogenic spondylitis is the lumbar region. We know that already. And for TB spondylitis, it is the thoracic vertebra. Again, we know that. And uh, what will be the amount of vertebral body destruction? Vertebral destruction. In pyogenic spondylitis, it will be only mild to moderate. Whereas in TB spondylitis, it will be very severe, high grade destruction of the vertebral body will be there. And number of vertebral involvement, number of vertebra involved, usually in pyogenic spondylitis will be less than or equal to 2. This we have been seeing for a considerably longer time. This I have been telling from the beginning, more than 2 vertebral involvement. And subligamentous spread. And this is again a very important point, which is usually not a feature of pyogenic spondylitis, whereas it is a very common feature of a tubercular spondylitis. And what about the disc loss or disc involvement? In pyogenic spondylitis, it will be almost near complete to complete destruction. Near complete to complete destruction. Whereas in TB spondylitis, it will be no or only mild destruction of the disc will be there. Again, this is very important. Relative preservation of the disc. No or mild destruction. They might involve the disc. Yes, paradiscal type will involve the disc a little bit, but not like pyogenic spondylitis. They will be, they'll, they'll be having only a no or mild disc destruction. And uh, what about the vertebral body enhancement? Vertebral body enhancement pattern. In pyogenic spondylitis, it will be diffuse and homogeneous enhancement with the contrast. Whereas in a TB spondylitis, it will be only focal and heterogeneous. Or it will be multifocal and heterogeneous kind of enhancement you will see. And intraosseous abscess. Intraosseous abscess is very, very rare in case of pyogenic spondylitis, very common in case of a TB spondylitis. And paravertebral abscess. So it will be ill-defined. It will be there, but it will be ill-defined. And the walls will be thick and irregular. Thick and irregular walls. This paravertebral abscess in TB spondylitis will be well-defined. At the same time, the walls will be thin and regular or thin you can tell it as smooth walls also, smooth, thin and regular. So this is really, really important to understand. So this is a very important table which I told you. So you have to know this table for your exams, how to differentiate between pyogenic spondylitis versus TB spondylitis in MRI. Now let us see some of the images that are associated with this particular topic. So this is an X-ray. Remember in exam, there is a lot of chances you will be asked X-ray rather than MRI. So what you are seeing in X-ray is the fact that first one you can see the disk space here and you can see the disk space here. The disk space is definitely reduced. So this is what we refer to as disk space narrowing. And next thing you can see here the end plate is so typical. You can see the margins of the end plate very clearly. But here you are not able to see the margins of the end plate clearly. This is called the blurring of the end plate margin. This is indicative of destruction of the end plate margin. And uh, that is typical of TB spondylitis again. Here you can see a vertebral body collapse. A vertebral body is actually collapsed. I will put in a blue color. So here there is a collapse of the vertebral body. At the same time, you can see the paravertebral abscess also. A well-defined paravertebral abscess with the vertebral body collapse, very characteristic of a TB spondylitis. And again, you can see this is an anterior 
scalloping in the anterior type. So this is scalloping of the anterior margin of the vertebra. Along with that, you have vertebral collapse also. You can see very clearly. This is an example of scalloping of the anterior margin of the vertebra along with the vertebral collapse. Here this image is a CT image, but it's not useful for diagnosis as such. It cannot be that accurate like MRI, but still it can tell you a lot of things, even a CT image. What you are seeing here is a large segment of the vertebra is involved. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, almost I don't know below that. So almost 5 vertebra are involved. I told you anything more than 2 is involved strongly towards a, uh, your um, TB spondylitis diagnosis. And next, you can see this is a pre-vertebral abscess. You can see a well-defined pre-vertebral abscess with involvement of 1, 2, 3, more than 2 vertebra. So definitely again this must be a TB spondylitis only. And here you can see a bird nest type of abscess, the fusiform abscess. It's again a paravertebral abscess where you can see the, you cannot see the spinal cord make out very clearly. It must be, the vertebral column must be somewhere here. But you can see a well-defined abscess over here. So this is what we refer to as something called a bird's nest abscess, a fusiform paravertebral abscess. Clear, typically if it happens above D10 but below D4, you might get this kind of bird's nest type of paravertebral abscess. It's a very, whenever you see a well-defined paravertebral abscess, that usually indicates a TB spondylitis. Clear? And kyphosis, if they ask you the deformity, whether you will see in pyogenic spondylitis or TB spondylitis, deformity always indicates a TB spondylitis than a pyogenic spondylitis. I didn't tell you in the previous table, you can add it on. Deformity is common in a TB spondylitis and usually very, 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 very rare in a pyogenic spondylitis. Clear? So with this, we have finished the bone and joint TB also, especially the pod spine. We can move on to the final entity that is called a miliary tuberculosis. This miliary TB, already I have showed uh, some images in the previous section itself, in the previous video, I think, for the, if I'm not wrong. So where I've showed you, there are small, small, small millet seed-like nodules you have seen, and they are in random distribution in the lung. And typically they are one to two millimeter in size. We have seen that already. But remember, I've showed you only the pulmonary image, but you can see this kind of nodules elsewhere in the body, in many places in the body. That's what is going to happen in a miliary TB. There is going to be a massive lymphohematogenous spread, which means they can spread either by lymphatic root or they can spread by hematogenous root. So they're going to have a massive lymphohematogenous spread to many different places in the body. So lungs are the most common, that's all. Spread within the lungs and different parts of the lung is actually the most common, but they can also spread to other areas of the body like CNS, choroid plexus or choroid of the eye, then skin, liver and spleen, kidneys, adrenal glands. These are some of the organs that are commonly involved, as far as I know. But seeing the lung picture itself is enough to diagnose a miliary TB. It's very, very classical. Clear? And who are at risk? The patients who are at risk of this lymphohematogenous spread, massive lymphohematogenous spread, are the ones who are immunocompromised. Typically, HIV patients are those receiving cancer chemotherapy or patients who are pregnant, very young children, severe malnutrition. These are the patients who are at very high risk of developing this miliary spread of tuberculosis. Remember, it can happen during any time. It can happen during a primary tuberculosis itself. Usually, if it's a primary tuberculosis, it happens after two to five months of initial infection, classically if the patient has susceptible risk factors. If it's a secondary tuberculosis, means it can happen any time. Whenever the patient goes for this immunosuppressed a secondary activated TB, which may be, you know, like clinically insignificant, they become a miliary spread. So both are possible. So miliary, it doesn't mean it can happen only during the primary or secondary. It can happen during any stage of the TB, miliary spread, depending on the immunocompromised state of the patient. Okay. One of the important characteristic features of this miliary TB is this multi-organ spread. It's a multi-organ involvement and all these organs will be involved with this granulomas. Actually, what are these random nodules? These nodules are nothing but small, small granulomas. 
That's what you are seeing in the imaging. Small, small granulomas. Clear? So, these organs also can be filled with this kind of granulomas. And this multi-organ involvement is again very classic of a miliary tuberculosis. And on the closest DDs for miliary tuberculosis is your uh, miliary sarcoidosis, which can also mimic the miliary tuberculosis in the lung, but they may not have similar picture in the other organs elsewhere. So that is some different part of the diagnosis we will discuss later on if there is time. But this miliary tuberculosis again will be treated like how you treat a routine tuberculosis with some special additions will be there because you are going to treat like a extra pulmonary tuberculosis also because there will be massive extra pulmonary spread to other organs also. So with this we can complete the tuberculosis clinical features. In the next section we will be discussing on the investigations and the diagnosis aspect.